Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kat, and we're here again with the read along of the Cyborg Inquirer by Meklator. I had to cut down last week's video so you get to admire Kvio while I say hi and tell you that we are moving on to chapter 11 and 12 this week. Thank you guys for tuning in. For chapter 11, we skip ahead for a week and Gwen has been busy fixing up all of the implants that were damaged in the first competition. Yeah, we learn that no new implants or new materials will be ordered, so she has to work with whatever she has and try to fix as much as she can while all the reference books she has are 20 or at least 10 years outdated. We also learn that Rora's friend Mazana apparently has an implant or like her mechanical foot was installed improperly. It meant she, her legs weren't the same length and she couldn't really walk and her foot was, her ankle's reaction was delayed. And like, how is this person an acrobat with all of these issues? Like, how did she function up to this point? Because Gwen is doing her best to make it better. And apparently she achieves that, at least to a degree. And we also must have missed part of the competition because with her lack of new supplies since the second competition, she'd been hard pressed to find the right wiring for the implants. So the second competition happened off page and we won't get to hear about it. Oh, huh, strange. I would have thought we get to see all of the competition. Oh, Mazana is there to help though because Gwen and Roa still haven't exchanged a single word since the first competition. And, well, it's such grown-up drama. Because it's not like Gwen could just go to Rora and tell her, yeah, I didn't know what the fuck was happening. The longer you wait with that comment, actually, the harder it will be believed for Rora, I would say. Gwen contemplates whether she could survive without her implant, because if the mistress acts on her threat and takes uh, Gwen's eye back, then Gwen isn't sure how well she would fare. Which then begs the question. She says that, oh well, my tumor has been removed. It's like, yeah, but why didn't you find yourself just a surgeon? Why did you need a cyborg surgeon? I mean, you could have had your tumor and your eye if it had to removed without getting cyborg implants. Was that not an option? Is that why we only have cyborg surgeons and then healers? Is there like no medical field in between? This is very confusing. This part actually amused me. Gwen is on her way to talk to Rora because we can't have that much teenage drama between adults, at least not for much longer, I would say. Rora's gaze shifted to the watchmen loitering in the hallway. Performers awkwardly trundled around them, pausing long enough to frown at the watchmen, Gwen, Rora, and the State of the Union before finally moving along. Well, if you have to stand in the hallway long enough to wonder about the State of the Union, and you'll be there for a long, long time, I assume. I know, this is just, upon first reading, I actually giggled at this part because that was actually a good line, I think. Well, Rora and Gwen talk for about two seconds and Gwen wonders whether she had fallen for this pessimist. Followed straight by, that was ludicrous. You couldn't fall for someone you hardly knew. And I would agree, you barely know Rora. You've been on like half a date. You talked maybe all in all for like half an hour at absolute best. Um, I wouldn't say you are in love. That seems a bit strange to me. Because Rora was the only one who didn't show up at Gwen's office to have her implant checked. Gwen is doing that now. After she forced her way into Rora's room using a screwdriver so Rora couldn't shut the door on her. So, you know, again, very mature behavior on both sides here. But she opens Rora's implants and then gets zapped. And you left wondering, why do you have rubber gloves if they do not work? as they should at all. Anyway, she gets herself zapped, but they are both fine. Well, 
Gwen has butterflies in her stomach and does wonder why she didn't kiss Roa when she had a chance. Because shit went down on at the ball and it would have been even more awkward had you gone through with the kiss while everybody around you was being shuffled into the next room and an announcement was made. That's why you didn't kiss her, Gwen. Roa complains that Gwen played her for a fool and then instead of telling Roa that she didn't know what was going to happen, Gwen retorts with What are you talking about? You are the one who asked me to go to that ball. Shouldn't I be pissed at you for flirting with me only when you needed a date and then ignoring me? It's like, how old are you, Gwen? Seriously. Just tell her what you actually needed to tell her and ugh, this immature quipping is just like... Ugh. It really adds nothing to the character. You know, aside, unless the goal was to make her less likable, because that certainly worked. And then it's like Gwen doesn't have her head in the game at all, so Roa complains, like, why didn't you tell me this was happening? I could have been better prepared. I would have turned up in my performance gear and not in, like, a fucking ball gown. And Gwen's like, you think I knew about that? Bastion only told me what was happening after you were all brought into the other room. Why is Gwen so surprised that Roa thinks she knew about it? Because the last time she looked at Roa, her thought was like, oh no, Roa looks betrayed. Roa thinks I knew this was going to happen. That's literally the last time you looked at her. And now you're like, oh, you think I knew about this? It's like, yeah, of course she does. No wonder we have to deal with teenage drama if nobody uses their head to actually think. Well, it takes three pages of conversation, but finally Gwen just tells Roa, yeah, I didn't know that was going to happen, and thankfully Roa is a bit more forgiving and trusting than Gwen, and actually believes her. So Gwen tries to fix Roa's implant, and they have a bit of a conversation about the competition, where Gwen also suggests that Roa could join a group instead of doing everything by herself because that would increase her chances of making it through and Roa is miffed like no I can do this all by myself I don't need anybody else on my team and you're like okay I'm not sure how much she would really benefit from just joining a team halfway through I mean at least now she knows that her implants while inconvenient don't kill her when she goes into water, so depending on who you get on your team and what the next part of the competition looks like, you could just kick your whole team out by picking the wrong people for your team. So she might actually be better off by herself. Roa is indeed a very trusting person because she tells Gwen that she trusts her with her life. And I'm over here like, oh, girl, desperation is not a good reason to trust somebody. Because that's all it could be at this point. They hardly know each other and mm, we get a bit more of the sexual tension on Gwen's side. Like at some point, Rora moves so close that Gwen can smell her perfume. Which then makes me wonder, were you sitting at arm's length to fix her arm implant? Because otherwise you would have smelled her perfume back then already. But yeah, Gwen is definitely terribly hot for Aurora. I think this is the last time I mention it, but we have another instance of Gwen using swear words to appear probably more mature, I don't know, and it completely backfiring, so doing the only thing she knew how to do. She fucking compartmentalized and pushed the forgetting to the back of her mind. She would deal with that later. I think that this is not a sport where you really need this fucking in there. Even if that's how Gwen is supposed to talk, it's, it seems completely unnecessary. Yeah, but we learn that Gwen fears forgetting everything about her past. But I still don't know why it happens or how. In chapter 12, we're still with Gwen, and it starts out with an unmarked dream and some... Rather explicit making out between Roa and Gwen. That's okay, Bastion is there to wake her up rudely. 
And because Gwen is so professional and mature, she just opens the door to him in nothing but a t-shirt. And then starts dressing in front of him. And despite the fact that the last time she talked about him, she wasn't certain whether she could trust him at all with anything, and that she hated him, she now is so sexually frustrated that she wonders how he would be in bed. And you're just over here like, girl, you have issues. Yeah, there's also a line with... Um, when thinking about the last time she had anything phallus shaped near her and I'm like, too much information. I didn't need to know this. You haven't been with a man for a while. Okay. Cool. But yeah. Damn, Gwen is horny and needs to get laid. It's really bad. So Gwen gets dressed in front of Sebastian and then also puts a belt on with a pistol, holds the knives and sheaths, and I'm like, Bastion is there to collect you to go to the mistress, and the mistress is okay with you being armed this much in her vicinity? That seems really weird after the stuff that is happening with the competition. I would expect none of the cyborgs is allowed to have any kind of weapon at this point. So Bastion and Gwen get to the mistress's office, and Bastion really seems to dislike her as well. And the way it is described just makes me think, mm -hmm, okay, so he's supposed to be scary and impressive and whatnot, but I'm not buying any of it. If it was possible, Bastion stiffened further. Despite a thin stature, his grim expression indicated barely refrained violence. It was as though a beast lurked beneath his skin, waiting to get out. And any other person that look alone would inspire terror. The faint-hearted might be tempted to shit themselves when the great bastion could be a level dead gaze on them. Once again, italics. Screw italics. And also this just makes me think that he's like an angry, cliché emo kid just standing around glaring at you and it just doesn't work for me at all. Anyway, the mistress welcomes Gwen to the circus after Bastion leaves. Because it's not like she's been there for a couple of weeks already, but she gets a proper welcome, as you know, if you can call it that, from Celeste. And it turns out Gwen is also there to have a checkup on her cyborg implants, which then again makes me question why is Gwen in the circus at all if the mistress, Celeste Beckett, is way better at dealing with implants and the mechanical bits as well. What do these people need Gwen for? Gwen tells you a bit more about the world, like a part I didn't know before at all. So apparently Celeste collects remnants or rare technology. And most of this seems to be digital because digital technology is super rare these days and Gwen has hardly ever seen any of it. I'm like, so you're traveling through space, you have cyborgs, but nothing there is digital? Okay. I feel like I needed a chapter at the very beginning telling me this technology has survived through the ages and this has regressed to Victorian ages and I'm really confused. Maybe there's a reason you don't really see sci-fi and steampunk crossed over this much or why you don't see steampunk in space. So Celeste takes out Gwen's chip to check on something or do something. I doubt she's just checking on something. But as soon as the chip is removed, Gwen is overcome with the urge to return to the circus. I mean, she is still at the circus, so I'm not sure where she would possibly try to go in this instance, but Apparently removing the chip has this effect. And also, her memories vanish instantly. Like, she can barely remember who she is. She doesn't know where she is, just that she wants to go back to the circus. So after installing the cyborg implant, all of your memories have mysteriously moved from your brain to this chip and can be removed with, like, a, the push of a button. 
what is the rest of your brain doing in this? Like all the bits that tend to contain your memory. They just sit there as like useless flesh or I'm really confused by the concept. We do find out that Celeste seems to have retractable metal claws because her nails do show up in Gwen's X-ray vision. It doesn't add anything to the scene in this moment, but I imagine it will come in handy later, or it will be important later. After the checkup, Gwen leaves and does question something. Why was the mistress performing engineering checkups on cyborg implants? Well, because she's the one who installed them, and she is the most capable person in that regard, on like in the whole circus. Yeah, but I imagine she that wasn't actually a checkup, or it may have been a checkup as well. But she pos probably did something to the chip, and um, you will find out what later. And Gwen won't like it. Yeah, like I said in the very beginning, we get some answers. So the top surgeon in the circus is the mistress herself. As to why she needs Gwen to do anything for her is a complete mystery to me because clearly she's better equipped to do all of it. And she also stood there and watched Gwen doing the first surgery and she doesn't care whether these people survive or not. So what does she need Gwen for? Is she just not in the mood to do all of these surgeries? Or if the implants really matter to her and she wanted them preserved as best as possible, then she would be doing those surgeries herself. So I really don't know what's going on at the moment, but it doesn't make much sense. Like and subscribe if you want to help this channel out. And let me know whether you read the book in the comments. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next week with another video. Bye, guys.